My name is Nicole DeRosa. I, some of you probably do know me from the meetings. Others who don't know me, I'm a tax manager at Witham. Um, I do a lot of work within the automotive industry and also the individual arena, um, pretty much all things tax. I've never touched an audit, so I consider myself a one-trick pony. And um, yeah, that's about it. So with that being said, we have a jam-packed agenda for the next 45 minutes or so. Um, I do talk fast, so if you think I'm talking too fast, Feel free to tell me this is slow down and I will try, um, but we do have a lot to cover. So we're going to talk about the CARES Act, um, an overview, some business changes, some individual changes, and then go through the SECURE Act just a little bit, a brief overview and some individual changes, and then kind of some ancillary miscellaneous items at the very end. And then again, um, we're going to close out with any questions that you may have. So let's get started. The CARES Act, um, which we're obviously very familiar with probably at this point, but the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Se Security, aka CARES Act, was passed by Congress with overwhelming bipartisan support and actually signed into law by Trump on March 27, 2020, which honestly feels like it was so long ago, even though it really wasn't. Um, but these days in quarantine, every day just kind of seems to merge into one another. Um, this over $2 trillion economic relief package delivers on the Trump administration's commitment to protecting the American people from the public health and economic impacts of COVID-19. The CARES Act provides fast and direct economic assistance for American workers, families, and small businesses and preserve jobs for our American industries. Obviously, depending on who you ask, not everyone will consider it fast and direct, but we all know that you know, they tried to do their best with getting money out to those in need as soon as they possibly could. Um, so assistance for the American workers and family through the economic impact payments and other means the Treasury Department is ins ensuring that Americans are seeing direct and fast relief in the wake of the coronavirus pandemic. And we honestly haven't seen anything like this since probably back in like 2007, 2008. So it has been quite a while since these types of payments were actually um, came to fruition. Um, assistance for small businesses, the Paycheck Protection Program, which I'm sure we are all quite familiar with because our clients are probably applying or they did apply already. It's providing small businesses with the resources that they need to maintain their payroll, hire back employees who may have been laid off, and also cover applicable overhead. Provide or preserving jobs to the American industry by implementing the CARES Act. The Treasury Department is taking unprecedented steps to preserve jobs in, industry adverse, in industries adversely affected by the spread of COVID-19. And I seriously hate the word unprecedented because I feel like that's another common word that everybody is using nowadays, but it is true, we are in unprecedented times. And last but not least, um, assistance for state and local governments. So through the Coronavirus Relief Fund, the CARES Act provides for payments to state, local, and tribal governments navigating the impact of the COVID-19 outbreak. So, first off, we have the much anticipated qualified improvement property fix, which we were all anxiously awaiting um, for several years now at this point, since we knew that the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act kind of messed things up a bit there. But QIP, Qualified Improvement Property, is defined as any improvement made to the interior portion of a non residential building any time after the building was first placed into service. So, it's very important to know. Um, again, improvement made to interior portion, non-residential building after it was first placed in service. So the TCJA intended for, the, um, for businesses to be able to deduct such improvements over 15 years, but due to a drafting error, the depreciable life of the QIP um, was actually set to 39 years and thus not eligible to take bonus depreciation. We all knew that this was a mistake. They didn't dot their I's, they didn't cross their T's when they were, you know, scribbling in the margins when they were drafting the TCJA, um, the bill. But until recently, there was nothing that we could do about it. So now the CARES Act provides a retroactive technical correction to QIP, um, which sets the depreciable life to 15 years, effective 1-1-18. Now, obviously, yes, we are in 2020 already. 2018 returns have been filed. Some 2019 returns have been filed. Um, however, there is still obviously things that we can do to help our clients. So being that it's 15 years, it's this um, QIP is bonus eligible. So it's eligible for 100% immediate expensing. So you can either go back and amend or consider filing a 3115 for 2019 tax returns. 
to take advantage of the deduction. Um, you know, you can also consider filing a superseded tax return that includes the 3115 and the favorable 481A adjustment to take advantage of the 39 year life to 15 year life for, and bonus depreciation. You'll most likely need to amend your state tax return though, because obviously most states do not accept superseded returns. I have already had two returns that I've had to go back and actually file superseded Fed amended New Jersey because New Jersey is one of the states that does not accept superseded returns. So now being that the deadline is technically July 15th, we have until July 15th to file a superseded federal tax return if we wanna take advantage um, of this for 2019, obviously if a return has already been filed. So do keep that in mind. And you could also electronically file superseded returns. <laughs> um, so moving along now to the interest limitation change under 163J. So under the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, the deductibility of business interest expense was limited to 30% of adjusted taxable income, ATI, with any excess carried forward under the new section 163J. The CARES Act temporarily increases the 30% of ATI limitation to 50% with adjustments for 2019 and 2020. But it is very important to note that there is a difference with the application depending on your legal entity. And this was kind of snuck in there. Um, it wasn't kind of explicitly stated. S corps, it's effective for 1119. So for 2019 returns and 2020, you use the 50% of ATI. And most um, tax softwares automatically did kind of update for these changes. Partnerships, though, it's effective for tax years beginning 1120. So I know that that was kind of a big deal. Um, you know, I, like I said earlier, I work with a lot of automotive clients and a lot of them are obviously partnerships and they were kind of questioning this 50% versus 30% thing. But it is important to note that S corps, yes, you get the 1119 treatment. Partnerships, unfortunately, you have to wait till 2020 to take advantage of this 50% of ATI. Um, there was, however, a provision added for 2020 that will allow taxpayers to elect to use their 2019 ATI in computing, in computing their 2020 limitation, which obviously is very important because many businesses will have significantly lower taxable income in 2020. So the election to actually use the 2019 ATI could potentially yield a more favorable tax deduction and then obviously generate a bigger loss. So do keep that in mind that there is an election that can be made. And it is also important to make sure that you're taking advantage of bonus appreciation and the interplay if you do have any floor plan interest limitations and not to miss out on potential deductions, which I'll obviously explain in a few slides when we get into NOLs. Um, similar to the QIP change, consider filing a superseded return for 2019 S Corps to take advantage of this 50% of ATI limitation if it obviously makes sense. If it doesn't make sense, obviously there's no need to file a superseded tax return. But for some clients that you know, they're, they're close, um, their interest might be limited, and it makes sense to go back and file a superseded return or even, you know, once July 15th passes an amended return, um, you know, you might want to just try to run a query and see which clients it impacts. And by query, I mean query with your, with your tax software. So employee retention credit, this is a one year only credit against the employer's 6.2% share of social security. In a nutshell, the credit is available to any business that is forced to fully or partially suspend operations due to the coronavirus outbreak, but continues to pay their employees during the shutdown and whose gross receipts have declined by more than half. The business will receive a credit against its 6.2 share percent, I'm sorry, 6.2 percent share of Social Security payroll taxes for each eligible quarter. I'm not going to go into too much detail here with regard to the calculation, but I did want to just note that it is a credit on a quarterly basis. And if you do take out a loan with a forgiveness component, the credit is not available. So the IRS basically just doesn't want you to double dip, i.e. benefit from the loan forgiveness and then get a tax credit as well. So again, if there's any loan forgiveness potential, this credit is not available to your clients. So make sure that they are aware of that. Okay. In addition to the employer retention credit, the CARES Act seeks again to kind of alleviate the burden of employers by allowing a payment deferral of the employer's share of Social Security tax. So this is to be paid back essentially equally December 31st, 2021 and December 31st, 2022. Um, obviously, we're not really quite sure yet how this will logistically play out in practice. <laughs> um, 
But similar again to the employer retention credit, you can't double dip. So if you take, if your client takes out a loan and there's a forgiveness component on it, this deferral of the payment is not allowed. So again, no double dipping. And obviously if we think about it logistically, that, that makes sense. Um, so just keep that in mind. All right, we're gonna shift now to provisions for individuals. Um, so it's no longer obviously news to us but the majority of tax filings and payments were postponed until July 15th, which applies to all taxpayers with a filing original or extended due date or payment that was due on or after April 1st, 2020 and before July 15th, 2020. Uh, these postponements, again, no news to us, were automatic and they did not apply to any monetary threshold. Originally, they had had a monetary cap, I think 1 million, um, but then obviously that was removed when it was actually signed into law, which kind of was a good thing for a lot of our larger taxpayers who, you know, might have had that, um, might have been affected by that limitation. So the removal of the cap was, was great. Um, extensions beyond July 15th will require obviously an extension of time to file. Payment is due at the time of the extension of time to file. Remember, extension of time to file does not include extension of time to pay. So July 15th is obviously our new April 15th. Penalties and interest will commence after July 15th if the return is not filed and or if the payment is obviously not paid. So do keep that in mind. Again, no, no, no news to us. Um, there is exceptions for the postponement which apply to certain payroll and excise tax filings or payments for certain informational returns, but I'm not gonna go into detail on this here, but again, this is kind of no news to us at this point. Um, we're very much aware that April 15th is no longer tax day for 2020. All right, net operating losses. Um, building on what I mentioned earlier about generating business, bigger losses, this is huge. Um, so obviously prior to 2018 and the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, NOLs could be carried back two years and carried forward 20 years, and we could offset 100% of taxable income. But the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act obviously changed things a bit to disallow carrybacks, but allow for indefinite carry forwards, offsetting only 80% of taxable income. So not horrible, but obviously not ideal. The CARES Act came in and temporarily reverses the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act to a certain extent and will now allow for a five-year carryback of NOLs arising in 2018, 19, and 20. Losses carried to 2019 and 2020 are eligible for 100% taxable income offset. So essentially, the CARES Act just repealed everything TCJA related. Um, but the TCJA rules do go back into effect in 2021 and includes tax years 2018 through 2020. Um, so consider, you know, filing those 1045s and carrying back the losses. Um, to five years prior. So 2014, we're looking at now, um, you know, I actually have a couple of clients which we're doing this for. And, you know, I had spoke to the partner and said, do we want to go back five years? And basically, obviously you want to carry it back as far as possible because once the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act rules go back into effect, those years are no longer essentially open years to carry back losses to. So go back as far as you possibly can, 2014 and also reap the benefits of the Pre-Tax Cuts and Jobs Act tax rates. Um, so there's a question, any update on extending the due date from 715 to 915? And I have not heard anything um, that would suggest doing that. Um, everything that I've heard is, you know, July 15th is the new April 15th and it'll just basically continue as normal um, July 15th. Well, you know, if you extend a return, it'll be till either, depending on obviously the type of business, 915 or 1015. So again, no extension potentially again. Well, I'm hoping there's no more extension. I just want this tax season to be kind of done. Um, so moving along to do, 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 section 461, excess business loss limitations. Um, obviously, like I said before, anything TCJA has basically been repealed, tweaked, um, temporarily suspended, et cetera. Excess business loss limitations are no different. So under the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, the deductibility of losses was capped at $500,000 with any excess converted to an NOL. So here we go again, the CARES Act retroactively repeals a limitation for tax years 1118 through 123120. So again, um, consider amending returns if you are subject to the limitation. 
um, to take advantage of the potential NOL carryback if able. We, got, we talked about NOLs already. You're able to go back five years now. Be careful. Um, and this kind of snuck up, and I always like to talk about real life situations, and obviously we're on the same boat on this one. Um, tax returns that were filed during the time when all of these changes were taking place, which I like to call kind of the transitionary period, most tax software platforms were constantly automatically updating returns to factor in the various changes. Um, if a return was prepared prior to the changes and not locked down, um, there is a chance that it was inadvertently updated if another user opened up the return prior to filing and you might want to double check to make sure that what was actually um, submitted to the IRS, what was, what was actually filed was what you thought was filed. Um, just because again, the cap was kind of removed on this $500,000 and it might have inadvertently been filed the right way, but your client might have a copy of it the wrong way. So just kind of keep in mind that that may have happened um, for some of your clients that went out, I'm gonna say early because technically now it's early. Um, and there's a question about NOL carrybacks. Uh, I mentioned that uh, I would go back to 2014 2018 NOLs would be carried back, yes, to 2013. Um, however, the returns that I was talking about, it was a 2019 NOL, which that's why we're carrying it back to 2014. Okay. Moving along to charitable contributions. It might not seem like a lot, but at least it's something and every little bit does help. So the CARES Act will now allow an individual to make a cash contribution of up to $300 made to certain, and I quote, qualifying charities um, to deduct the contribution above the line in computing adjusted gross income. Now, obviously, we don't know what certain qualifying charities are. I, could, I would imagine that, obviously, that's, it's not going to be a GoFundMe because we can't deduct those anyways. Um, and I've seen quite a few GoFundMes out there since the coronavirus has you know, taking its course. Um, but I would imagine that maybe it's a coronavirus relief charity. Um, but again, who knows? That's just my best guess. And obviously, until we have clarification from the IRS, we will not know what certain qualifying charities actually mean. But um, this applies to all taxpayers. So whether you itemize your deductions or not, um, if you obviously, if you have, say, for example, if you have deductions of $10,000, um, they take the standard deduction of $24,400 for married filing joint, you do get that $300 in addition to that $24,400 standard deduction. So, you know, if you itemize, you get it. If you don't itemize, you get it. it. It applies to everybody. So for those of you who have clients that do itemize, please note that the contribution limit of the 60% has also been suspended for 2020. So charitable contributions can actually now be deducted up to 100% of adjusted gross income excess contributions being carried forward five years. And also um, it is important to note that this does not apply to donor advised funds for charities whose exempt purpose is to support other charities. And the $300 charitable um, contribution begins for 2020, 1 1 2020. All right, retirement fund changes and utilization. So the 2019 contribution deadline for qualified plans, including SEPs, has been extended to, 7, um, to July 15th as well. So, you know, for the returns that have been going out, um, you know, obviously they have a SEP contribution. They have until July to make that contribution payment. Historically, obviously, it's been, you know, April 15th, or if you extended it, it's, you know, October 15th, but right now it's July 15th. Obviously, if you extend it, then different story. Um, if you also take money out before age 59 and a half, typically you pay tax on the distribution as well as a 10% penalty if an exception does not apply. The CARES Act, though, adds a new exception and allows taxpayers to take a distribution up to $100,000 in the year 2020 free from penalty. Tax will still be owed, obviously, on the distribution. However, the distribution will escape that 10% penalty. And in addition, the income tax on distribution can be repaid rapidly up to three years from the date of distribution. And the distribution can be contributed back to the retirement plan any time during the three-year period following the distribution date and essentially to be taxed um, as a tax-free rollover. So this applies to individuals who 
um, are diagnosed, whose spouse or dependent is diagnosed, who experiences adverse financial consequences as a result of being quarantined, furloughed, or laid off, or having work hours reduced, or being unable to work due to lack of childcare. Um, and in addition to this new exception on early distribution, the CARES Act temporarily waives a requirement for a minimum distribution for this year only and includes inherited and traditional IRAs. So keep in mind um, the tax brackets when deciding if you will waive the RMD requirement or not. And you obviously make sure you're having this conversation with your clients because you obviously know your clients and if they you know, have an RMD requirement. But if 2020 puts them in a lower tax bracket, obviously take the, take the RMD. Um, if you're in the same tax brackets and don't need the cash, you may want to keep the money in the tax deferred plan to kind of ride the eventual market uptick or, well, we hope it's a market uptick, but um, just obviously be cognizant of the tax brackets when determining if or if not, you will take an RMD. And now for what I like to call the headliner um, of the CARES Act, but well, I mean, it seems like it was a headliner. It was literally on the news daily. Um, the individual um, or economic stimulus payment, whatever you want to call it. So the IRS basically determined eligibility based off of either the 2019 tax return if filed, um, and if not filed, the 2018 tax return, and if that was not filed, um, Social Security statements. Um, eligible employ I'm sorry, eligible taxpayers include U.S. citizens, uh, not available for non-resident aliens, trust estates or individuals claimed as dependents on another return. And it also applies for or to US citizens living abroad. And you obviously must have a social security number. So checks were cut $1,200 if you're single, $2,400 if you're married filing joint, plus $500 for each child under the age of 17. Um, obviously, if your um, child is 18 and in college, they're a dependent, you don't get that extra $500 bump and they don't get a $1,200 stimulus check. We had quite a few clients questioning that as sure, um, I'm sure yours did as well to you. Um, people who make too much money will unfortunately obviously not receive a check as the payment phased out once your AGI hits certain thresholds. Single um, with no kids phased out completely at 99,000. Married filing jointly with no kids phased out completely at 198,000. And um, depending on how your most recent tax return was filed, the receipt should have been electronic if the direct deposit information was provided on your 2018 or 2019 tax returns um, and payments were to be received between now and basically, well, a couple, couple weeks ago now actually, um, and December 31st, 2020. So there are still payments that will go out um, between now and the end of the year. So, you know, if your client didn't receive one, um, you know, I had a client who literally, she was a dependent last year and now she's not this year. And she only made $30,000, but we filed her 2019 tax return last week and are hopeful that she'll receive her $1,200 economic um, impact payment. Hopefully, we'll see. I'll let you know. Um, the IRS has implemented two tools for taxpayers to use, which I'm sure you're also very familiar with by this point. Get My Payment Portal, which you can check the status of the, of the check, and also the Non-Filers Portal, which basically you enter the information if the return's not filed, um, and there's also no social security received. And I believe that's where you also were to enter banking information. Um, but I do believe that that might not be applicable anymore since the first wave already kind of went out, but I could be wrong. So don't quote me on that one, but any questions that I'm, we're going to transition now to the secure Act. So I just want to make sure we're kind of covered on this, on the cares act before I transition. So feel free to type them in. If not, I'm gonna continue. Okay. All right, so SECURE Act. Um, I guess I actually missed a slide for that, but um, yeah, so I should have put a slide before here to talk more about the SECURE Act, but um, actually, no, this is actually the, the right slide, sorry. Um, so SECURE Act stands for Setting Every Community Up for Retirement Enhancement. Clearly, we love acronyms, um, and this SECURE Act was, of 2019 was designed to assist in saving and investing for retirement with various provisions to incentivize retirement planning, diversify options available to savers, and to increase access to tax advantage savings programs. The estimated cost of the SECURE Act, which I cannot believe, $15.7 billion. All right. Um, 
stopping real quick. We do have two questions. Um, one being attendance questions for CPE credits. No, there are no polling questions. Um, CPE is going to be automatically issued based on when you log in, when you log out. And question number two on the RMD, is a deferral, is, is it deferral and have to do it in 2021 if skip 2020? Um, RMD, is it the deferral and have to do it? You can, you can opt to not take the deferral um, in 2020 and then just take it regularly in 2021 um, or take it and not skip it essentially. I think that was what you were asking. I'm not sure if it isn't. Um, let me know and I'll try to do better with answering it. Um, but moving along to retirement, which is obviously the SECURE Act, um, pretty much the focus of the SECURE Act. So it repeals the maximum age of, um, for traditional IRAs starting in 2020, so long as compensation is still received. Uh, required minimum distribution age was actually raised from 70 and a half to 72 for distributions beginning in 2020. Individuals who attain the age of 70 and a half after December 2019 must begin taking distributions at age 72. So that kind of is like a catch all for that transitionary period um, from 70 and a half to 72. There is also partial elimination of stretch IRAs. Um, stretch IRAs are not my forte. Um, but prior to 2020, essentially the death of a plan of um, participant or an IRA owner, it allowed the designated beneficiary to stretch the tax deferral advantage um, of a plan or an IRA by taking distributions over the life of the beneficiary. So participants who IRA owners whose death is after 2019, the distribution to a non-spousal beneficiary is required to be withdrawn from the plan within 10 years following the plan owner's death within certain exceptions. And eligible designated beneficiaries have the ability to take distributions over their life expectancy. That's my extent of stretch IRAs. And um, maybe you guys know more than me on this, but um, I did think it was important to obviously note that there was a partial elimination of stretch IRAs. And for those of you who don't know Gumby, he is stretchy and I love clip art. Um, so to answer the questions again, no, you do not have to take two RMDs in 2021 if you skip 2020. To my knowledge, it is just a, you skip 2020 and then you commence um, regularly 2021 and onward. And we have another question about how will the taxes be refunded if the early retirement distribution is repaid within three years? Will there be a new credit on forms 1040 for 2020 and 2020 through 2022? Um, what I think will happen is there is going to be kind of like a tracking form that will be added essentially, and that will be required to be filled out. Um, to obviously, um, similar to the first time home buyers, $10,000. Um, I don't know if you recall that, but you basically had to kind of keep track of it, um, you know, obviously to repay it and all that stuff. I, I expect there to be something similar for the retirement, but obviously nothing official has come out yet. So I can't say for sure, but that's where I think it will be going. But who knows? Um, so 529 plans moving along. The expansion of Section 529 Education Savings Plan to cover registered apprentices and distributions to repay qualified education student loans. Obviously, this will help um, anybody. Well, it's basically expanded. So distributions made after December 31st, 2018. Uh, Tax-free distributions can be used to pay for fees, books, equipment required for the designated beneficiary participation in an apprentice program. So, you know, electricians, union workers, um, any apprentice program essentially is now included for 529 distributions, which is great. And tax-free distributions up to $10,000 are now also allowed to pay for interest on principle of a qualified education loan of the designated beneficiary or sibling of the designated beneficiary. So we can also use it now to obviously pay down student loans. So make sure um, that you will, are asking your clients um, to cover your CYA um, and make sure that these distributions are um, being used for the intended you know, purpose and get it in writing, make it a work paper, um, because obviously if your client gets audited, that would stink if you didn't actually do your due diligence to make sure that it is appropriately not taxable. All right, and I definitely talk very fast because we are 
getting a lot closer to the end. Well, this is the last slide. Um, so <laughs> under the Secures Act, this is kind of like things that didn't really fit into the earlier slides, but under the Secure Act, um, and this again was kind of snuck in there too, I feel like the kitty tax rules reverted back to pre-Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Now, um, obviously Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, the kids income was taxed at the highest trust rates, which I actually liked. Um, because a lot of times we'd have to extend the kid's tax return if the parent's tax return was extended because we'd have to wait to link the parent's locator. Um, and we couldn't get out these kids' tax returns early on. Now, obviously, yes, um, pre-TCJA, um, I'm sorry, with the, TC, with the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, obviously the kid's income was taxed at a higher rate, but I mean, we could get the returns out a lot sooner. We didn't have to wait if the parent's return was extended or not. But um, so now that's, back to the way it used to be, link the parent's return to the kid's return and extend the kid's return if the parent's return is um, extended as well. Uh, beginning in 2018, Congress eliminated the reduced AMT exemption amount for children to whom the kitty tax rules apply and who have net earned income as well. So, you know, keep that in mind. Again, just can't link, we have to link them now again. Back to the, we're basically going backwards. Um, and last but not least, under the CARES Act, student loan repayments, including principal and interest, may be deferred for six months to September 30th, 2020 without penalties or interest charges. And it's important to note that these loans must be federally owed loans. It's not just every loan underneath the sun, it has to be a federally owed loan. So that's my miscellaneous things that didn't really fit into a bucket. And with that being said, any additional questions? <laughs> and I'm sorry, I know I talk fast. That was supposed to be 45 minutes, but it's Barely 35. Pamela, they still get their credit. <laughs> Pam? They'll get credit. They will? Okay. <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> Just wanted to make sure. So if you guys have questions, um, feel free to shoot me an email um, if you think of anything, and I'll do my best to respond back. Um, well, I'll, I will respond back whether I know it or not. And if I don't know, I'll find out the answer. But um, I guess we are the first guinea pig meeting for a virtual meeting. Um, I do see a question on loan forgiveness or self-employed. I am not, um, that is not my forte. Um, I believe our July 18th meeting though, um, Frank Boudelet and Matt Walsh from Witham, we have a SBA kind of team here at Witham. They will be speaking on um, pretty much the PPP stuff and loan forgiveness, I believe. So definitely make sure to tune in for that. Um, it's a bit away. It's not now, but I can't. Yeah, keep every, everybody should, keep, should uh, <laughs> register for the July meeting because we will be talking about that. And um, as Nicole said, going forward, unfortunately, we are going to have to do virtual meetings. But I applaud everybody for uh, being flexible and joining and getting on. And uh, we had 88 people participate today. So good job. And I am seeing another question about the stimulus checks go to individuals that don't provide direct deposit information. Um, I know that obviously some, some people have already received payments if they were directly deposited. I am not aware specifically of clients that have received a check. Um, so if they are eligible, they should, they should check online where's my stimulus and that would provide the obvious information on to, you know, when they expect to get the actual receipt of payment. But it's not really known, I guess, specifically. So I'll stay on for a few more minutes just in case you guys have, um, somebody did just say I received my check this week and they didn't have direct deposit. So it sounds like, you know, are trickling out <laughs> and clients have received paper checks so yep confirmation that's great and still trying to look up. when will pension contributions for corporations that elect to defer contributions be due as 1 1 2021 is a bank holiday um, well since it's a bank holiday um, you know obviously it's the day after any federal holidays I would, that would be my best guess. Uh, somebody's daughter received a paper check three weeks ago. Oh, that's good. So they are getting their money. <laughs> okay. On 
the website for some clients, it actually gives a date. Yes, checks will be mailed. Yep, the where's my stimulus payment. And basically for that site, all you need is your social security um, and some identifying information. If you haven't visited it, it's, it's very similar to where's my refund. Um, if someone doesn't get a check, a stimulus check and they were entitled to, will they get a credit on their 2020 taxes? To my knowledge, um, I am, I do not think so. I am not hundred percent sure, but I do not believe that they will receive a credit on their 2020 taxes. That's why there's multiple waves of the stimulus checks going out. I think eventually they do catch everybody that was entitled to one. Um, question, will stimulus have to be repaid if income is higher in 2020? Now, I know at the beginning of all of this, they were talking about um, essentially a true up on the 2020 tax return. And perhaps that might be where some of the confusion is coming from. If they didn't receive a stimulus check, but they should have gotten one, credit on 2020. If they got one and they shouldn't have, then they'll, they'll owe more, essentially kind of similar to the um, premium tax credit. However, um, to my knowledge, that is not actually law and that's not actually going to happen. So again, to my knowledge, it will not have to be repaid if income is higher in 2020. Um, and is there any discussion in Congress about possible tax exclusion of unemployment benefits as there was, an, uh, as there was after the Great Recession? I have not heard of anything um, yet. There, who knows what will happen, um, but obviously unemployment benefits are tax federal purposes um, and not for uh, New Jersey purposes. So make sure you are properly treating that on the New Jersey return. But again, who knows, maybe they'll come out with something excluding federal tax purposes. And Jonathan, um, he is our, our guy, well, trust guy, obviously. He noted that one of the exceptions to the 10-year maximum IRA stretch rules for inherited IRAs is for a qualified disabled individual or a trust for their benefit if certain requirements are met in the trust. So thank you, Jonathan, for that. Okay. Um, Question, can you take advantage of the social security deferral if you receive the PPP loan, but only up until the date of the PPP loan is forgiven? Um, we, could, we could ask this to our FBA team on July 18th, um, but from what I've been told, if you take out a loan that has a um, forgiveness component, you are, not avail you are not able to take advantage of the deferral. Uh, Jonathan also notes to take advantage of the IRA rules. Do you, oh wait, do you have to certify that you were negatively affected by the COVID-19 pandemic? I honestly don't know how they could actually um, do that. <laughs> um, I think that by signing a tax return and filing, essentially you're kind of self-certifying that you were negatively affected by COVID-19. Um, but I, I maybe look under penalties of perjury or by, you know, filing the form. I don't exactly know, um, but that should be interesting to see how they kind of regulate that because I can see people easily abusing this. Um, question about will the additional 600 unemployment be taxable in New Jersey as a federal payment? That's a great question. Um, I don't exactly know. I would assume if this comes as like a, if it comes as a 1099 miscellaneous or, I mean, obviously if it comes as a 1099 G, it's, it's I, I would say no, it wouldn't be taxable in New Jersey, but if it comes, if that separate $600 for unemployment comes separately somehow, um, that yes, it might be taxable to New Jersey um, since it is a federal bump. But again, that's kind of one of the things that I feel like we'll, we'll know in the near future because we are, are, we are in unprecedented times. <laughs> I'll stay on because questions seem to keep rolling. <laughs> uh, the IRS issued a statement that earned income credit payments to decrease to deceased taxpayers must be returned. However, this doesn't appear in the CARES Act. If an executor or executress failed to do so, is this enforceable? 
Um, trust states are not my forte. Um, I know it just enough to be dangerous. So I will have to get back to you on that one. Unless Jonathan, if you want to type in an answer to that question, the IRS, again, the IRS issued a statement that the earned income credit payments to deceased taxpayers must be returned. However, this does not appear in the CARES Act. Um, if they fail to do so, is this enforceable? Oh, he corrected himself. The economic income payment, not the earned income credit payment. Jonathan, do you know the answer to this? If somebody who passed received one and it wasn't returned, is it going to be enforceable? I honestly don't know how they would actually enforce it. Um, but that's a very interesting question. Because again, I, I, I do see people abusing this and saying, hey, it's, it's 1200 bucks, why, who's gonna know? <laughs> Uh, Jonathan says, you need to have been alive, it is in the act. Yes, we know that, but if it was um, sent out to a deceased taxpayer and not returned, essentially, do we know how they can enforce that? Or no. Because I guess the, also, I mean, how would the IRS know if you were deceased, if you filed a 2018 return and didn't yet file a 2019 return, they wouldn't know and maybe it was sent. Right, yeah, not earned income credit, economic income payment. Right, they will know when you file the final return, but I guess how will they enforce it to being returned? If they received it, obviously in error. And there is um, apparently a Q&A section on the IRS website about having to return the stimulus for a deceased taxpayer. Yeah, I, I just, I don't know how they're gonna enforce that. And the Social Security Administration and the IRS do share information. Um, somebody said that the Social Security Administration can take it back. So I guess that's maybe how they'll enforce it. Thank you for that. And again, if you missed it at the beginning, these slides are available um, on your events, my events page on NJCPA in the handout section if you'd like them. And since a whole bunch of you are still online, I'm going to do a little pitch. Um, if you're interested in taking a dance fitness class tomorrow at 5 p.m., I am teaching a live dance fitness class um, that was also posted to the open forum. So feel free to click the link and join for a 45 minute exercise session. Um, when will taxpayer service be back online from the IRS? Um, they, there was an article that I think that was written by the Washington Post or I'm not sure, but they were talking about um, hopefully, I think as soon as next week, um, they're trying to bring back employees. But unfortunately, um, it seems like, I guess, people keep getting sick and then they have to close down for deep cleaning. So they're struggling to do so. But Hopefully next week, that would be nice because obviously they're very, very, very far behind um, with processing paper returns. Um, also, just to kind of give you guys a heads up, if you are going to be preparing NOL carrybacks for your clients on Form 1045, there is an option to fax them in um, instead of mailing them in. And they said that if you are to fax them in, it should be processed within 90 days, which is obviously going to be a lot faster than if you do mail them in. So just keep, um, just to be aware of that. I forgot to mention that earlier. Oh, PPS is back on a limited basis. Thank you, Peter, and hi. <laughs> um, yeah, the practitioner priority service line is, is open on a limited basis. Um, somebody just confirms that. I'm sure the wait times, though, are astronomical. <laughs> Nicole, thank you so much for presenting. I think it went really well. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you guys for asking questions. And, you know, obviously, you know, I, I, like I said, I do talk fast and I went through it pretty fast, but hopefully you got something out of it. And, um, yeah, I'd love to see you guys soon, but it doesn't look like that's going to happen until at least next year for these meetings. <laughs>
Yeah, but at least everybody should sign up for the July meeting. Yes, July 18th is our next federal interest tax group meeting. So virtually right. see you all there. <laughs> Thank you, everybody.